to be quiet. Who wants to know about flipping? Yes. yes. That's why we're here. Thank you. That's why we're here. We're here to listen to Carmine Sabatella talk about flipping. Now, Carmine, why don't you give people a bit of an understanding? What do you do in real estate? What do I do in real estate? Yeah, talk a little bit about your history. So I grew up um, in the restaurant business. My family was uh, owned and operated restaurants. So I went to school for business and public relations, and I stepped into the business with my father shortly after I graduated from college. Um, seemingly was a great opportunity. Um, I thrived in the business. I opened my own restaurant and cocktail lounge in 2005 um, on my own and ran both of them successfully for cumulatively roughly 20 years. And that business shifted about, I'd say, 12, 15 years ago. It just, it became different. Um, it was very litigious. Um, workers' comp was crazy, um, all the liability. And I liked it because I like to serve people. I love being around people. I love helping people, folks coming in, me getting to know the regulars, um, serving them food and leaving, seeing them leave happy. That's what kind of fed my soul, for lack of better words. Um, but then as time went on and when everything started to shift, I realized I wasn't really around my people anymore. <laughs> um, and I was miserable. And I had the golden handcuffs. And I was like, this is just... A nightmare. And at the time, I was basically a single father. My daughter was little at the time, um, maybe seven or eight years old. And I remember she was deathly ill. There was a really bad bacterial infection going around through the schools, the private school systems in Pasadena, and she got it. And she, this poor kid was literally like on her deathbed at home. I, was, I stayed home with her, and I remember her looking at me. It was like a Friday night or Saturday night, and she looked at me, and she's like, Dad, it's so nice that you're home with me. And at that point, I was like, got to make a change. I was 38 years old, 37 years old. And I thought my kid shouldn't be up to be on her deathbed for me to be able to stay home and spend a weekend evening with her. So at that point, I started getting the wheels in motion. And I, it took me about two years to sell my businesses. I liquidated both businesses. I sold my home to get into real estate. Now, if anybody tells you that their first year in real estate was just this insane success. I call bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't care who's mentoring you. Um, you got to put blood and sweat and tears into it. And also, you have to put 100% of your time into it or it's not going to be that successful. It's not going to be the success that you want it to be. So I shifted gears. I got into real estate, residential sales. Um, I thought I wanted to do real estate on the west side, so I joined Eagle and Vokler um, on Rodeo, Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. and soon found out that I did not like that area at all. And um, I was basically doing leases for a year. They were just pawning off leases to me. And so I remember a woman who was a very dear friend of mine. Um, she was a very seasoned agent at Sotheby's Realty in Pasadena. Called me up and said, let's have lunch. So I went and had lunch with her and she said to me, I didn't even sit down. And she said, what the F are you doing business in Beverly Hills for? You're so well connected in Pasadena. It makes no sense. Why are you not tapping into your community? And I thought, yeah, you're right. Like the grass isn't greener. I need to come back home and tap into my community. So I shifted gears. I came back here. I joined Sotheby's. She said, if you don't want to join this person, she said, I think you should, I can say his name. Um, she said, I heard Mark Ogden, some of you might have heard that name, Mark Ogden, he's been around for a very long time. She said, I heard Mark Ogden is gonna get ready to retire soon. Mark Ogden sold me my very first house that I bought. So I know Mark Ogden very well. And she said, I heard he's, really, he's looking to retire soon, um, but I don't know on what level, what capacity, but if he's gonna retire, it'd be really good to slide in right now because it'd be you know, good timing. So I called Mark, sure enough, Mark said, let's do it. So he brought me on. We actually co-listed three properties together, knocked them out of the park, and 
he watched me. Um, he helped guide me here and there. And then on the fourth deal, he said, you know what? You don't need me. You're going to do just fine on your own. He's like, in fact, I think I might hinder where you're going. So he let me go on my own. And that year, I became, I did the seventh highest volume in the office out of all 76 agents at the time. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to set ego aside. And that's really what gets in the way of a lot of real estate agents is the ego. And that is from taking on a listing, working the escrow, and, and closing it. The ego gets in the way. So now I'm in real estate and development and design. And fortunately, I've been able to now host a show about what I do, and I love it. Um, and I'm around my people, period. I work with my people now. So if I go on an interview for a listing, you know within five minutes, I don't care what you do for a living. If you paint nails, if you sell cars, if you sell clothing, if you serve food at a restaurant, you know within the first five minutes of those people being around you, if these people are your kind of people or not. You just sense it. So a lot of times wasted in this industry when you're dealing with people who you are not your people because you can't see. Now, when I say people are not your people, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not good people. They could be great people. My mother is not my people. <laughs> no, she's not. Period. <laughs> I love my mother. I love her to death. Do I want to do a business transaction with her? Hell no. Absolutely not. So, yes, well, right? Good. Yeah. Would you all do a business transaction with your mother or your father? If the answer is no, then maybe you shouldn't be doing business transactions with a lot of the people that you come into contact with. You refer it out to somebody else who can handle it, who are their people, and you take that commission on that referral, and everybody wins. And you free up your time to work with your people, which are going to be far more successful with those people. So that's where I'm at right now. Thank you, Carmine. <laughs> I You're appreciate welcome. it. Yeah. It's part of why, I mean, it's just... This is not maybe your experience because you don't know Carmen. I know Carmen. I did some flips with Carmen. So I got a chance to work with him before he became an actor, back when he was a real estate agent. Quite a few a, years. A flipper. We do it together did. for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and what I don't know all of Carmen's story, but what I know about Carmine is how hard he works in his level of integrity. I know that when I hired him to work on a project, that that project was going to get done really, really well, well, when we partnered on projects, because there were a lot more partnering than hiring. Um, if, I wanted, if I wanted the success I was looking for, this, was the, this, this package was the package I needed to go to. Because he's not only a real estate agent, but he's also a designer. He also has a tremendous, did anybody look him up before they showed up tonight? Get a sense for his level of social media, his branding. Right? So this is the story I wanted you guys to hear. Because it's like, there's no excuses over here. He's doing what he does, and he does it really well. And this is what he does. And he doesn't do anything else. He does Carmine. But he does it really, really well and without excuse. So number two, I've gotten thank a chance you. to work with you. I said thank you. I, know. <laughs> I appreciate and I've given that. you a knuckle yeah. <laughs> Okay, I have gotten a chance to work with you during the flips that we worked on together. Um, I would say your excellent sense of style is part of that Carmine signature and what people look for. Mm -hmm. Literally, it's a Carmine house. Oh, okay, it's going to sell, right? What other elements do you think actually really feeds into that? Because it isn't just your sense of style that makes you so blooming. Like, people want Carmine. There's something beyond that. Right. Um, so I have an interesting gift that I've had my whole life, which is being able to foresee something in its current state, but visualize what it's going to look like as a complete finished product. So when I walk into a space, I can walk into a home within 10, 15 minutes. I could walk the entire house and I could tell you if it can be done or if it can't be done. So 
and my mind works like a matrix system. So like when I walk in, I'm like looking at walls and I'm shifting and I'm pushing this over and I'm dropping the ceiling and I'm throwing out that window and I'm adding wallpaper over there and my mind is working like this. Like, and I can't really be around anybody when this is happening because I have to see it. There are times where I just walk away from it. I'm like, this is going to, it's not a good one. Or I tell my clients, walk away from it. I've had clients that haven't listened. <laughs> you know firsthand. Oh, I know firsthand. I know. Again, we yeah. talk about working with your people. Right. Your people will listen to you, right? So I wasted a lot of time with this person because she got herself in over her head. She wasted a lot of money, not just her own. Mm -hmm. And I tried everything I could from telling her where we needed to be at the list price where I thought it would go out at, despite I told her it wasn't going to be a good opportunity. She didn't want to listen to any of it. So wasted my time. Why? Because I had that on the market for two months before it sold, maybe a month and a half, two months before it sold. And I'm doing open houses. And I'm, da -da, you know, right? So it's wasting my time because she's not listening to me. So I have, that, I have that ability to walk in and manipulate spaces, but also small spaces. That's my go-to. So I like to, I can take an 1,100 square foot house and make it feel like it's 1,500 square feet. Um, and I also, I also love to, I, I don't say I flip homes. I say I restore homes because I usually work on older homes from like late 1800s to probably mid century, maybe turn of the century, like 1960s might touch a 1970s, but that's pushing it 1980. And after that, I'm out the door. I don't want anything to do with it. You keep your granite and your block glass and get out of here. I don't want anything to do with it. So no offense. Um, <laughs> so, but, so I think the other thing that I have in my back pocket is that I can learn how to restore the old traditional elements, but also marry them with the modern amenities that we all need, right? We don't want to li li live in a jewelry box that you can't do anything in, right? You have to have it practical. So I think that's part of what I do is kind of restoring the old charm, but also bringing in the new modern amenities that we need to live in. Yeah. Okay. Flipping in Southern California is very difficult and competitive. Did I miss a question out there? No, but you just... Yeah, absolutely. Now, in some of your older homes, like I know when I did one, it was, it was, a, it was a 1905 home that was restored and, and had the non compete. Mm -hmm. Kind of nice. Yeah. And you yes. Kind of stopped doing that in about what, 1920? Yep. Ish. Mm -hmm. So my theory is, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm going to touch no, on this. No, that is my next question. Okay. My next question was literally, you can spend a lot on a flip or very little <laughs> on a flip, and you're, you have a particular strategy that you yeah. go in with every and time. You know what I would do. Yes. So, so again, I'm going to say that. this, and there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, I have mad respect for those of you who do this, because I don't know how to. I, yeah, so knob, knob and tube <laughs> is very dangerous. Um, it's also very old. Knob and tube is basically what you're, there's, there's an electrical knob and there's a tube that runs into it and it's wrapped in fabric. And it's what- Have you seen those? They put in right. all no. the old homes in the United States in mm -hmm. from probably 1895 to like 1925. Yeah, maybe 1930 and some of the, so knob and tube, knob and tube has to go. It has to go. It cannot stay in there. If you want to sell a house and say you flipped it, you better switch out that knob and tube. So not only is it a liability, it's also an expectation. It's an expectation. Like you can't you cannot say that something has been even partially renovated and keep knob and tube in place. It's just not you just can't do it. It's like saying, I just fixed up this house, but I left all the popcorn ceiling here with all the asbestos in it for you to deal with. No, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to scrape that crap off and you're going to start new. So I don't do, I don't know how, I shouldn't say I don't know. I don't know how to do turn and burn lipstick on a pig flips. He it's actually just, literally physically doesn't know how. I'm I don't. just telling you. <laughs> I would not know how to, I don't even know. I don't even know how I would do it. Because to me, that is just, it's, 
it, right? It's just regurgitation, right? You have a process, you have probably two or three templates. I don't care if you're fixing a Spanish, a mid-century, a craftsman, you take this tile, color, combination, and countertops, you go, whoop, I'm gonna put it in this house. I don't do that. Every single flip that I do is different from the one that I previously did. There's very few, because I get bored real easily. I don't wanna see the same light fixture. I get bored. I'm like, I want a new light fixture. I don't wanna use this again. So I don't know how to do it, nor do I really like find joy in it. Uh, most of my projects, I'd say, probably without holding costs, are somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars and $300,000. That's like my average. I've done some where it's about 100 to 120. I've done some where it's six, 700,000. Yeah. So, um, sorry, what was the rest of that question? No, that, my question is, why do you do that? Oh. When you have a particular style, a particular way you approach a house. He is going to, yeah. he is going, okay, he looks at a project. He's not going to take the ones that only need a little bit of, of work on them because it doesn't, he, he can't. That's not his style. That's not for him. Now, if I'm prepping a house for sale, then I can do a partial renovation. I can go in and I could go, we got to rip out this kitchen and the primary bathroom and we have to redo it if you want to optimize your sale potential. We got to get rid of all the carnations in your front yard and put gardenias in it because we want to optimize your sale, right? That stuff I can do all day long. That's easy breezy. But when it's a full renovation from the ground up, um, I come from a design perspective, not a construction perspective, if that makes sense. Don't ever, don't ever have a contractor make decisions on design choices, period, <laughs> period. Or me. I don't care if the contractor's <laughs> like, I've done a hundred of these. It doesn't matter. That's not, your, that's not your wheelhouse. Stay in your lane. I'll stay in mine. I'm not going to tell you how to build that wall. Well, maybe I will. But <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I will. I will, actually. I will but the reason why is, I'll give you an example uh, really quick, and we'll move on. No, um, my okay. clients called me. They, I had flipped a house in South Pasadena. To this day, it's the most popular home I've ever done, and it was the smallest house I've ever flipped. It was just shy of 1,100 square feet. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath bungalow on El Centro in South Pasadena, in the heart of South Pass, walking distance to everything. Didn't even have a driveway. No driveways. Um, alley access to the garage. It had been vacant for about 12 years. Part of the roof had been blown off. There was a family of raccoons living in it. The chandelier in the dining room was laying on the ground along with the ceiling. So this was a teardown. Everybody wanted to tear it down. The Historic Society was fighting it. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to let it tear it out. So that's why it sat there for 11 years. So I came in, wholesaler got a hold of it. I want 750,000. I'm like, so do I. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah, we all. I said, I'll give you 650 on a good day. Take it or leave it. She so said, how about 675? I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I bought it for 675. I converted this house. I opened up the floor plan between the living room, dining room, and kitchen. I made it a two bedroom. Actually, excuse me, it was a three bedroom, one bath. You had to go through one bedroom to get into the next. One of those weird tandem situations, right? Nobody likes that. So I converted it to a two bedroom, two bath, got rid of the third bedroom. People are like, why are you getting rid of the third bedroom? You're dropping the value of the home. No, I'm not. That's wasted space. It's not usable. Two bedroom, two bath, right? Gave them a proper primary suite with an ensuite bathroom, walk-in closet, and then I demoed the garage and I made it into kind of like a partial ADU, legally, wasn't actually an ADU. Um, that house sold for, what did I get for that? One, six? It was like almost $1,500 a square foot. That house, the owners, so I pre befriend most of my clients. You do? Yeah, um, because I love the people that I work with. And um, the owners of the property still text me today and they say, people walk up and knock on our house and ask us if we would want to sell it because they love it. And when I walk into, when I run into people on the streets and they talk, I mean, I did, 
I did an estate in Pasadena. We sold for what, almost five or four something, four, four million four, four something? Some, four point seven, I think. Nobody talks about that. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing project. They talk about this 1,100 square foot craftsman project. on El Centro Street in South Pasadena, and people still talk about it. It's crazy. That's a good question. You know the answer? Oh, I was going to say just something really quickly. One thing that I, I think is important for you to touch on is um, you always consider, like, who's the buyer? Oh, yeah. Like, that's a good point. Like, when you're looking at the market, like, what is, who's the buyer that you're going to envision in the house? Because that's going to yeah. affect how So I, I started a little, yeah, you're right. I and started. Then, and then we'll answer Kevin after the answer. Right. Yeah. So I started a little game with myself. Um, I would say probably about six years ago. Maybe longer than that. And I thought, what if I decide who's going to buy the house? Right, like power of persuasion, manifesting the destiny of the house. Who is the buyer? So then that's what I do. So I create the image of the buyer, and then I build the house around it. So that one, no, actually, that, yeah, that one was a young couple, maybe ha about to have a child, maybe not. I go through, I even go to like what kind of cars they drive, how much education they have, how much they make a year. Like I literally go through that. I did a little Spanish um, in Highland Park. And the demographic was a single woman in her 30s or 40s, probably a lawyer, maybe a marketing you know, advisor, works downtown, needs a quick commute, probably drives a BMW. Who bought the damn house? A female lawyer, like 32 years old, rolls up in a black Beamer. And I was like, there she is. There you go. There you go. First night vision about she got it. She walked in. Yeah. And the visualization really is kind of on point almost every time. Because I'm building it around, right? It's, and it's what is going to appeal. I, I don't care. And this is the thing with flippers, too. I don't care if I appeal to the masses. That's not what I'm trying to do. That's not where we work in this area. We're not appealing to the masses. I just want one buyer to give me the price I want. That's all I care about. I don't care, again, ego. I don't need 20 offers to make myself feel like I did a good job. I just need one really good offer, and I'm happy. Let's do, let's do Kevin's question, then I have two pieces I want to cover. Yeah. Before. Wait, which was? Oh, yeah. Repeat it. Oh, my favorite style. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of my least favorite houses to live in for myself is a Spanish. But it's my favorite style to actually design. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Spanish is my favorite style to design. Um, then would be craftsman and then mid-century. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh. I have a question. No, no, no. Take the question. Go ahead. So how do you split your time between flipper, agent, and any other stuff you have? Do you want my husband to answer that? Or do you want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, it's constantly reminding myself every day what's important at the end of the day. And really, at the end of the day, it's, it's my family and my home and my friends around me. Um, so I have to shut it off at some point. Um, but I'm a workaholic. I mean, I run 90 miles an hour most of the time. It's just part of my personality. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do know when I need to back off and I, and I didn't always know that. Now I know when I need to back off. Now, I mean, as you get older, you know, I can't do, I can't run it like I used to in my thirties or even, you know, my early forties. Like I'm, I'm maybe 50 soon and I have to just be careful. Be like, you know, I, you just, you just got to slow down a little bit. Yeah. So, um, it's just, and it's also understanding that you don't need to take on everything. Like I mentioned, you can refer something off and get the referral commission. I've negotiated 45% referral fee before. I'll give you an example. There's an agent who's very prominent in Pasadena. She's probably one of the biggest agents in Pasadena. Most agents don't like her. They actually like loathe her. Why? Because she puts on 5% commission, she gives the buyers, the, 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 the listing agent on the listing side, or I, I don't want to confuse you, the person buying the house, the buyer's agent, she gives them 2%, she keeps 3%. 
Does that seem fair to you? No. No, unless she's doing more work. Is she really? I don't know. I'm not there. I'm not seeing what she's doing to prep the house for sale. All I know is I'm working my ass off for my client and I want my 2.5% commission if you're getting 2.5% commission. So I was standing next to a woman the other day and she was complaining about this person. I can't stand her. I will never work with her again. She only gave me 2% commission. And I said, did you ask for 2 dollars She's like, what do you mean? I said, I've closed three deals with her and I've gotten 2.5% commission on all three deals. She's like, well, what do you mean? You can, I said, just ask. ask. I said, that sounds like it's your fault and your problem, not hers. And I walked away. And the bottom line is, open your mouth, be aggressive, and talk it out. She wants you to be happy too, honestly. And listen, I get it. Throw it out there. If it sticks, great. You're going to put more money in your pocket. But know that uh, people are going to bark at that. And you're going to back off. And, and everyone's happy. Point, I think also something else that you've gotten very good at being able to say no, you know, but also creating new parameters, creating expectations of availability, when you're accessible, when you're not accessible. Yeah, that's, you, gotta, you, have, you, you just have to set boundaries. Yeah. You know, clients calling at 6 a.m., calling at 1 a.m. I'm like, that's not happening anymore. Like, you know, so you just got to, on the front end of it, like, hey, guys, these are my hours of operation, you know? And if you really need me and it's an emergency, text me. Don't call me, you know, at 12.30 at night. Yeah, so I do nothing before 8 a.m., nothing past 8 p.m. Karma is a problem solver. Can you get that? So how much do you, how much problem solving do you think is part of your business? How much is problem solving and being good at it part of your business? Now I know from having worked with you. But I guess that's going to depend on what is considered to be a problem. Answer, go for it. Explain your answer. I'd say. 40% of the time, I'm solving problems. Yeah. yeah. Not problems that are brought on by something that I've done, but it's problems that exist within the infrastructure of who I'm working with by virtue of the property, people not agreeing, putting fires out more like it. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin. I know, isn't he wonderful? <laughs> I know. That's He's what so I'm here for. Go for it. Right. So I just went to, so I do a lot of meditation. I do a lot of self-care, a lot of self-care. Like literally sitting there by yourself going, you're, you're good enough, you're strong enough, you know, people like you, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but affirmations. Um, no, but, but in reality, it's really just about taking care of yourself. Um, I used to take on so much that I would suffer from great deals of anxiety. I would start to get um, anxious twitches where I would be like, I would, I remember at one point I was like, I bit my, the corner of my lip one time and then I just kept biting it because I was so anxious. And I was like, I'm literally drilling, driving a hole in my mouth because of the level of anxiety that I'm going, that I'm under right now. So it's understanding, and I don't like taking anything. I don't like psychotropic drugs. I don't like antidepressants, anti-anxiety. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not my thing. So for me, I wake up in the morning. I take my dose of CBD oil. Um, I eat healthy. I don't, I'm not really a drinker. Um, and I really pride myself on really staying in touch with who you are and what makes you happy. And I just came back from a retreat about four months ago or five months ago. I went to the Miraval um, Spiritual Retreat Center. I went for four days. I told my family, I got to go. I was like, I need, I need silence. I need and nothing against my family. They are wonderful. I love them. But I needed to. And I know when I need that. I need to reset. And we all need that. And whatever that reset is, you have to do it. 
My reset is we have a house in Palm Desert. When I need to reset, I take one of my dogs and I'm out and I go and I reset. And you just go and you have some silence and you, you really kind of like review everything that's going on and you kind of let go of what's not servicing you at that point and you hold on to what is. And then you go back home and you start again. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Well, Andrew. I'm circle back to your question and kind of wonder why you asked about why so much of it was fixing or putting out fires or whatever the word you, what you used for that was and how you um, avoid that being a time thing. Um, I find a, a large percent of my time is that and that's the difference between my hours that are my $1,200 an hour and my $20 an hour is that. And so how you, you know, what's your thoughts on that and how yeah. you deal with that? Again, I know it sounds like such a simple rule, but when you really think about it, really go home and think about it if you surround yourself every day with your people, okay? If your gardener is not gardening your yard the way you want them to, whose fault is that? It's yours. You haven't given direction. You haven't told them what your expectations are. You haven't shown them photographs of how you want your yard to look. Give them something to reference. If you're just gonna sit on your chair and complain, then you have nobody to blame but yourself. Now, if you explain this to your gardener and the gardener still doesn't get it, they're not your people. You fire that person and you hire somebody who is your person. So again, that transfers over to everything that we do with your contractor, your subcontractor, your vendor. Let me tell you, there's a window guy that I can't stand. He drives me up the wall and I won't work with him anymore because he just we don't drive. Like he just bugs me. And so I use somebody else. So when you start to surround yourself with your, per with your people and your network, then everything becomes much easier and seamless, right? It's not an easy breezy sale, but you know, it's much easier and it's more efficient. So I'll answer Andrew's question and you can be next week. Most of my questions have a purpose, you're absolutely correct. And one of the reasons why I ask that question is because my experience of real estate, working with Carmine and outside of Carmine, is that problem solving is the thing that makes you the most successful. Mm -hmm. It's not analyzing the deal. In particular, in Carmine's particular case, it's his capacity to design, but it's also his integrity and capacity to problem solve. I was on a project with Carmine and I got this text and I remember going, I'll look at that tomorrow morning and I'll talk to Carmine. Because I knew that Carmine and I together, we were gonna find a solution. I wasn't sure anybody else on the team would. Also, you also have to keep your cool. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting to. Like how you much gotta of the problem cool. you gotta keep your cool. There's been so many times where there's been a contractor standing in front of me, freaking out, <clears> screaming <throat> up, shaking, trembling, can't do that, spitting. Can't build that, and I'm can't, like, can't create that. And I talk like I'm talking now. And I respond like I'm responding now until they calm down and get back to the level that you need to talk to them. And then you have the conversation. Um, I do have an ability to, I'm kind of like a chameleon in this way in that I can really relate to most everybody that I come into contact with. So, you know, it's easy for me to relate to all different kinds of personalities. So that's really helped me a lot because I can go from a high strung situation where this person's like, Argh! and then I can go over here where this person's like, I'm like, uh, you know, stop with the quaaludes, get up, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, so yeah, so that helps a lot. It does. It helps a lot. So I asked, uh, I was at a meeting years ago with Bruce Norris. You know, who, if some of you might know who Bruce Norris is, but he's a regional expert who talks a lot on economics. I have him coming in May, March or May to give an economic update. Deeply respect him. I, I saw at a meeting, somebody asked him, so he's done over 2,000 deals? And somebody asked him, so in every deal you've done, how many of them is there a problem during the ESCO process? He's like, you mean out of every deal I've done? Yeah, I thought about it for a minute. He said, about 19 out of 20. So the expectation that it's gonna go well is what you set up, but the reality is that 80, that 40% 40, 40 of what you're gonna do is gonna be problem solving. So don't get mad about it, because what you're paid for as an expert in the world isn't just your network, your capacity, your design sense, your capacity with numbers, whatever it is that you as your talent. Mm -hmm. It's can you face that 40% of the time there's a problem and you're gonna be responsible for fixing it yeah. if you're in position of leadership. 
I also think that when you're speaking to somebody, you know, listen, it goes without saying, you should be respectful of your peers, you know, especially when you're a real estate agent. I don't understand why these real estate agents find it, you know, necessary to mistreat other agents or speak to them poorly or, you know, be shady in a transaction. It's a lot of that. Um, but I find that when you're engaged with someone and you're being respectful and you're giving them that opportunity, and Christina hit on the nose earlier, when you're present, right? Because we're all running like a million miles a minute half the time of our, you know, that we're out there working. But if you can just stop and, and quiet, the, quiet noise the noise for a moment and focus, then you're giving that respect to that person without even being super respectful, right? They're gonna go, oh, this person is listening to me. They're hearing me. So, and then it becomes a different relationship. Yes. Easier to put the fires out. Yes, I would say Carmine on some of the most difficult people that we have run into on our projects. I get sent in a lot. The neighbor in particular. On my show, <laughs> right. my okay. co-host does not have the ability to deliver any shred of bad news to anyone. He literally will fall apart. He doesn't, he, he doesn't know how to do it. So I am the one who always has to call the client on the show and be like, mm, by the way, there's 10 dead bodies in the basement. You want us to remove them or you want to remove them? You know, like, but, but yeah, so I don't know why I get volunteered to do all that, the dirty work. Because you're good at it. <laughs> I guess. Because you are, no, you're actually really good at it. He's good at keeping the calm. Like there was one, we split up on a project. There was one neighbor where I was dealing with the husband and there was another neighbor where he was dealing with the wife. And mm -hmm. the wife respected Carmine deeply. She thought I was a piece of shit, clearly. <laughs> she had no interest in me whatsoever. I remember, Chris, I remember calling Christine and I said, I think I talked to somebody different than you did. <laughs> exactly. I'm because, like, oh yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> but it worked. Linda Vista, right? Yeah. Uh, no. That, that yes, was the, Linda the, Vista the, was the lady the in, the in the back, right? Oh, was it the lady God. in the back? I think that was her. Anyway. Yes. No, there was that one. I was thinking of the fence over on uh, Descanso. Oh, yes. Remember the fence on Descanso? Mm -hmm. oh. That lady was. Gee. Her. Okay, yeah, who knew a fence could be such a problem? Yeah. Clearly. And Carmine did beautifully with it. So, um, so problem solving, that's why the question, problem solving. So Carmine, you have also, he does this design work. I was gonna do budget, but I think I might skip budget unless you guys are attached to budget. Carmine has an amazing social media presence. If Carmine, one could say that Carmine has a lot of ego, but I've worked with Carmine. Kermin doesn't have a lot of ego. We just described his level of grit and how he really is like, no, this is about solving problems and being present to people. Yeah. What does your social media bring you? Because there's a reason why you do it. Well, there's, yes, there's a difference between not having a lot of ego and also not dealing with stupidity. The, okay, go ahead. Just, Talk. I want to make that clear. That's different. I don't have patience for that. I, I can, I don't have a lot of ego, but when it comes to just blatant stupidity and i don't mean that by somebody not having the intelligence, intelligence. Not the intelligence. i know they just don't care don't want to pay attention don't want to focus a any agent in this room has been in transaction with the other agent where you have to do 50 percent of their work <laughs> right it's not fun and then you try to tell them and they give you attitude and you're like wait a minute yeah. i'm just trying to help you here you know so Social media for me, I mean, you know, listen, I don't have hundreds of thousands of followers, but I have a really strong social media presence. More importantly, my engagement is really high. So my followers are actually following me. They're not just pushing follow and they don't ever look at it again. They're really engaging in my posts. So for me, every post on Facebook that I put, and I can say this with 100% uh, I would say 98%, 98% <laughs> um, that when I post on Facebook after I sell a property, I get a DM and it's another client, boom. Like I just posted something on Instagram mm -hmm. and I got a message from this woman who said, oh my gosh, my daughter and son-in-law live in Arcadia and they cannot find a house, they've been working with this agent for six months, and I don't know what to do, can you help us? And I was like, yeah, give him my number. So the daughter text messaged me right away, we're having a conversation on Monday. Actually, we just had three of these come our way. Three of these come our way. 
Ryan's um, also an agent. Yeah, so this is my husband. Ryan and, Ryan and I are, are on the same team. We have uh, several agents that work with us on our team. We're building it right now. Um, I have, we have, I have a full-time design assistant. I have a full-time ad administrative director who, Cynthia, who you know really well, runs mm -hmm. the show. Yep. And then we have um, some really great people that we work with, escrow, title. I mean, these are like family. Like these are people that we would have over for holiday. That's how close we are. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of move forward. Chris. Question. So kind of going back to your exit out of your previous career in the restaurant business into the real estate industry, kind of close to that 40 year old mark. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how did you get to now the amount of success that you've had over the last, I guess, nine or ten years? It's a good question. Um, so here's what I tell anybody that I mentor or anyone who wants to get into design or real estate or flipping for that matter. Don't get fixed on the number. That is suicide. If you buy a project where you say, I want to get, I have to get 1.5 million on the sale, you're done. You can't. I would love to get somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5. That's my goal. I have my formula. I did the math. I looked at the comps. I ran all the numbers. And that's what I think my window is. But when you hit that bar with that number, so to your point, a lot of agents get into this business and they're like, oh, I want to make, I want to sell 15 million this year. That's fine as a goal, but you also have to make it a practical goal. I tell my agents that are coming in new, I said, look, if you sell two or three houses the first year, mm. you're doing good. really That's well. That's actually really good. You're doing really well. Yeah. Be proud of yourself, right? Set that expectation, be realistic, mm. and also know that it's going to be tough. It's a rat race. And 10% of the agents out there do 90% of the business. And that is true as the day is long, and there's a reason for it. Because a lot of people get in this business because they think it's easy, and they think it's quick cash, till they get hit with their taxes, and they're like, oh shit, I'm screwed because <laughs> I spent all my money. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, A hundred percent, yeah. There's an 80 to 7 percent failure rate in the industry, and especially right now. National, North, North. North. National in a stabilized market, I don't want to hear recession. Yeah. I don't want to hear down market. It's not. It's stabilized. This is a stabilization of what we're seeing, and it had to happen. Come on. I was selling houses for fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a square foot. That's insane. I just sold one yesterday. I just put it into escrow, all cash, 15 day close, $1,390 a square foot. So you tell me that's gonna happen in a down market or a recession, it's not gonna happen. Now, all of these lenders are coming up with these three, two, one buy down loans, right? Have oh. you guys heard of this? Okay, yeah. oh. so three, two, one buy down loan. No, <laughs> sorry. You what? I'm like, no. You don't wanna hear it? No, I want to hear it. I totally want to hear it. I want to. So, so for those of you who don't know what I'm saying, I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. Basically, the lender can come in. Let's say you have an $800,000 purchase, okay? To get that interest rate down below, it's going to give you a 3% drop on your interest rate. So you're going to get you down to 4% interest on the first year, but you got to you got to figure out what the buy down is. So on an $800,000 purchase, based on good credit you're basically coming in with a thirty-five dollars to $40,000 buy down on that loan structure. I'm giving it to you real quick in a nutshell. So what you have to do is you've got to go to the listing agent and you say, hey, listen, we've negotiated on the sale price, $800,000. We both agree, we're good. Now, I need you to up that sale price to $835,000 and you're gonna give a credit back to my set buyer at the close of escrow to buy down that loan so that she can get that interest rate down to 4% and it's a win-win for everyone. You sell your house, she gets good interest, and everyone's happy. That's happening now. So 
That didn't happen in 2000, 2007, 2008, and that's why the banks were not smart, the lenders were not smart, and they didn't come up with creative solutions. Instead, they said, fine, we'll just foreclose, mm -hmm. and look what happened. So that's not gonna happen. We're not that stupid anymore. So we got our bases covered. There are structures out there. Now that 321 loan's only gonna get you through the first couple of years, and then you're gonna refi into a conventional loan when the market stabilizes again. Hopefully it does in the next three years, which it will. So it's still a loss later. Yeah. So, oh, okay. No. Just a quick kind of follow up to that question. That leads to what you were saying about people getting in nutrition rate, 10, you know, 10 percent of people able to do 90 percent of the business. Mm -hmm. How could you rise to the, what advice do you give to a person looking to rise to the next level and rise above the noise in a market that's saturated? Right. So you're going to become a barnacle and you're going to attach yourself onto the biggest ship out there. You're going to find somebody who you respect, who you agree with their work ethic, and you're going to approach them with confidence and respect and charisma. And you're going to say, I would love the opportunity to work with you. I would love the opportunity to, for you to teach me how you do this. And if they can't do it, they'll probably refer you to somebody who can. But that's the biggest, most important thing. A lot of agents will go to brokerages because they have these great mentorship programs. But you don't know who you're going to get. So I say, jump into a brokerage, whatever appeals to you. If it's Compass, if it's Sotheby's, if it's Berkshire Hathaway, if it's EXP, if it's Side, whatever it is, jump in and get to know, do your homework first. Look up the agents, because agents' profiles are everywhere. We don't have anything to hide. It is all out there for everyone to know. Phone numbers, email address, home addresses, don't show up at their house. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. So do your homework, and, and that's the best way to do it. Find somebody that you respect, somebody who is doing really well in the area, and see if they have time. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And the one thing I will say, too, before we move on to the subject, give yourself a little cushion, too, financially. I've never borrowed money in my life. I blew through all my savings after I sold my businesses and my house. I had to borrow $50,000 from a friend during the first year because I wouldn't go into my daughter's nest egg. I had a little, I, like a little account set aside for her. I had, I'm like, I am not touching that. I will not touch it. So I had to borrow 50 grand, paid him back in a year. But again, you got to set ego aside. But I knew I would, I knew it would change, and it did. So, in working with Carmine to get back to the social media, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I noticed. One of the reasons why pairing with Carmine on the projects we did together was because Carmine's social media presence was so strong that before he would finish a house, we had people already figuring out if they wanted to purchase it or not. And that was because of his social media presence. It's because he had become known and was willing to be known. It brought a Carmine project. It was a Carmine style. Right? You tease it out. <coughs> tease it out, tease it out, tease it out. Dangle the carrot on social media, do your stories, do the hard posts, tease it out as much as you can. And then when you launch that product, hone it in in a small window because you want everyone to see how much everyone else wants this property, right? Agents will make a really mi ba bad mistake in having four open houses in one week for four hour windows. It's unnecessary. Do one or two in a two hour window so that that place is jammed. When you go to a concert and you go to get food, are you gonna go to the line that everyone's standing in or are you gonna go to the vendor that has nobody there? Depends on how hungry you are, right? <laughs> but really, it's all perception. And I, I wanted to say that because that's also, and then Tina, you can absolutely be next. The other process is, well, if he is an agent and a flipper and that's what he does, why is he an actor all of a sudden? Because to me, he was an actor all of a sudden. Because here I am working with him, right, as an agent and flipping houses together. And Although like, that was in the works for a long time, you just didn't know about it. Oh, well, see, there you go. See, to me, he was an actor all of a sudden. And I want, I want to get to that, but because it's very short. But Bless Tina, you. you go ahead. And then we're going to wrap this up in like three minutes. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I've always innately had a gift for design. 
even since I was little. Yeah, so no, no formal education in it, no form, nor formal training. I literally just taught myself. Like I, I won, when I was in my 20s, I was like, you know what? I want to start landscape designing. So I literally bought like five books on horticulture and I taught myself majority of the species, where they zone, how you plant oh, them, how you that. aerate them, if they're, you know, all the climate zones, and I taught myself. So you want to be the best at your craft? Teach yourself. Like be a sponge, right? So design was something that I always did on the side during my business in my, my, my tenure with the restaurants. I would do, do little, like I designed my restaurants twice. I just decided I, well, I want to renovate because I was bored. I just like blew out everything, closed shop for two weeks. No, actually like a month and, month. and redid my restaurant one time. But I always took on little design jobs on the side. It was always a hobby of mine and I loved it. Yeah, and then I just made it my, my life now. Yeah. So to me, all of a sudden you were an actor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an actor. Excuse me. It's what, real. TV personality. It's real. Yeah. You're a TV personality. Yeah. Okay. All of a sudden, you're a TV personality, because he, he, you, you signed on just as we were bringing the last of our work to a close. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how that happened, because I've always chalked it up to your sense of presence in social media. It was because of my social media. Um, it was actually just right time, like right place at the right time. Okay. Um, the production company sought out my business partner who had a really big presence on social media for his work, not personal, but for his business. So they reached out to him, he was a landscape design. he is a landscape designer. So they reached out to him, they said, hey, we have this idea for the show called Inside Out. It's based in Southern California. You're gonna do the outside, we're gonna get somebody to do the inside, you guys are gonna battle for the budget and you're gonna redo these people's homes. Awesome. So they said, so we think you'd be a great fit, but do you have somebody that can do interior design? He just kind of sat there with his mouth open, didn't really know anybody, but his business partner was sitting next to him who I went to middle school with and high school with, who follows me on social media. And she said to them, actually, I grew up with this guy. He's a pretty cool dude. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say that, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm yeah, all right. Okay. And, um, but I think you really like his stuff. He, do, he, he does really great work. Check out his Instagram page. And she pulled up her Instagram page, handed it to the producer, and he went, holy shit, I like this guy. So they called me, and that's how it happened. Thank I you. thought it was a joke. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was my, yeah. it was a bucket list item of mine since I was in my late teens. I always wanted my own show on HGTV. I just always thought it would be really cool. We were, that's why I said we were, we were actually working on it for four years before okay. it actually even got greenlit. Okay. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. So second season will drop this spring and then we will start third season right after. Nice. Yeah. That's fun. So what are the lessons that I've tried to bring you guys? Chris said it early, grit. A lot of grit, a lot of hard work finding your lane, staying in your lane and doing it really well. Carmine does Carmine really well. He doesn't do anything else. You can see as he's gotten older, he's even become more committed to him doing him, and that's what he's good at. And being willing to be seen, whether it's social media, whether it's working with difficult clients, whether it's showing up and being able to say, yeah, I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Being willing to be seen, being willing to create a network that he's authentic and integrous with. If you're somebody who doesn't like to be in front of the camera, that's okay. You can have a point person, but it's how you brand yourself. Maybe you have a child that likes to be in front of the camera. <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone. You finish a project, you launch a new house, have that kid in the living room hanging out, having a, a cup of water, playing on the swing in the backyard in a couple photos. But you want to make you have to make it relatable. And what makes it relatable is personifying something, right? So you can post pictures of houses all day long, but in, nobody's really gonna pay attention until you put somebody in it. And then all of a sudden it becomes real, right? So if it's not you, find a point person to do it. It's easy, very easy. Also when you're flipping, I will say this, there's a lot of designers out there, interior designers, 
that if you just want a consultation, it might cost 1500 bucks, $2,000. Do you know how much they're gonna bring return on that $2,000 for you? If you just don't feel like you have any sense of style or design direction. <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I'm just being real. <laughs> Listen, I don't, I, math, I, it just starts to scramble in front of me and I can't even look at it, right? I don't care about it, it's not my thing. A lot of people don't care about design, right? Or style, they don't care, it's not their thing, that's fine. But other people it is. And so it would be very easy as a real estate agent or a developer or a flipper to hire a designer if you need it and say, hey, I just want you to come up with a very remedial vision for me and let me run with it. Could be worth it. How many times, Carmine, would I say, <laughs> became one of our jokes like, well, I'd do it this way. And he kind of looked at me and like, go, no, Christine, <laughs> like, back out of the lane. <laughs> and I just started, I just started to go. And so it's not my part of the project. <laughs> when I take on design jobs or even real estate jobs, just, I do, first thing I, hilarious. first thing I say to my clients is, listen, I not, I'm not a shy person and I'm going to let you know if I don't agree with something. Yeah. So don't take it personal. I guess, I guess that comes right out immediately. And I'm a very kind person, I'm a nice person, I'm not mean. I'm the king at like underhandedly letting you know <laughs> <laughs> that I don't like it. No, I'm, like pretty, it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty blatant he's, about he's it. Pretty I'm pretty blatant, blatant about it. About but, it. The, but the point is, I don't have a sense of style. That's the, the purpose of the story isn't that Carmine and how he treated me, it was I actually don't have a sense of style. But what Christina brought to the table for me, and you don't for your houses, I know, because you said you don't, and I said I agree with you. I don't, he right? agrees with me, I don't have a sense of style. Yeah, but, um, but what Christina brought to the table for me, I have a great deal of respect for Christina. Great deal of respect for her. The way she is a mother, the way she manages her time, I mad respect for her. I will call her, and, she, and I'm, because I can get a little, I get a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs sometimes when I'm deep in the trenches of a project. Like my mind's like <laughs> So I'll call her and it's like 5.30 in the evening and she's not picking up and I'm texting her. I'm like, Christina, I need you to call me. And she's like, I'm sorry, but I'm having dinner right now with my family and I'll call you after when I'm done, period. Like just mic drop, shut up, <laughs> I'm right. busy. No, right now. Right, so like done. Like, and I'm like, you know what? I have a lot of respect for her because of that. I don't have the ability to do that all the time. Um, and also Christina, also keeps her cool and she's very organized and she's very professional and yeah very good at what you do you're very sweet thank you you're welcome yeah. so we we complimented each we other we complimented each other well i stay out of the design line right yeah and, and she I, facilitates and I, and I all the and i manage the finance yep exactly yep i call her can i spend this much money <laughs> Is it okay if I spend this much money? <laughs> Sometimes the call came before. Sometimes the call, no. Oh, wait a minute, no. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize, I'm about to beat up for that one. No, um, it's, it was a good partnership for us. Part of what worked was that neither one of us needed to blow up. No, never, we never got into it. Never, don't want to get into it. It was, we don't need to get blow up. We understand 40% of what we need to do here is solve problems. That's the last point I want you guys to walk away with. What you're being paid for as an expert in the situation isn't just what you bring as far as capacity to create something. It's that you keep your cool and understand that what you bring is the capacity to solve problems. Mm -hmm. You bring that, people will pay you well and they will respect you because you're an actual leader in the project. I agree. That's my experience with Carmine. All right, guys, Carmine. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.